This conference will now be recorded. Hello students, I'm Dr. Divya from TNNSD. So we are in seventh chapter, Evolution. So what is evolution? We have learned about origin of life, then uh, evolution of life forms. Like what and all the theories behind this. All this we have discussed in the last class. And evolution means, or evolutionary biology. What is that? The study of? life forms on earth, different life forms, how it formed and uh, what and all evolutions or what and all changes happen during each time. So what and all uh, happened from one life form and how it is changed to another form of life. So in between the things which and all, uh, the, there is a sequence of events. So these events are connected together and finally it reached to a new life form. So that, that study, it is called as evolutionary biology. So what is exactly evolution means? To understand the changes, changes in the flora and fauna. So that took, this evolution means it's not a single day process. It took million of years. So after so many years, you are seeing a changed form. Okay. So we must uh, learn about the origin of life for to understand all these concepts. Then evolution of pair, evolution of stars, all these things, all these things we have discussed. In last class, we have discussed about all these things. Then origin of life. That also we discussed about all this origin of life. Then uh, what is that Big Bang theory, all those things we discussed. So in today's class, we are going to discuss about evidences of evolution. So we, we need evidence. Singly, we can't believe that evolution happened or these things are evolved from another life form. We can't imagine such things without any proof. So there must be some kind of proof to believe such things. Right? So so we need evidence or proof for all these things. So fossils. Fossils are the main evidences. Right? You know that fossil, what is fossil? Fossils, they are the main evidence for such evolutions. So fossils that remain hard, that means the hard part of life forms that found in rocks, that is called as fossil. So rocks, rocks form that sediments. You know that rocks that will form sediments and the cross section of that, the cross section of earth crust, that shows the arrangement of such sediments. Layer-wise, that sediments have arranged. So those cross section that helps in the study, study of the history of Earth or such evolution. So where we can see the fossils, fossils, they are the remains of hard parts of life forms found in rocks. So fossils, you can find those things in rocks. They are the hard part of life forms in rocks that found in Rocks. You can see here fossil of dinosaurs. Then earlier organisms. And all you can see here in this picture. You can see the fossil of dinosaur. So different age rock sediments are there, right? Each rock, each layer in each time they will form a layer. So when we are going to the deeper part of that earth you will get the old layer, right? The aged layer you will get. So different aged rock sediments that contain fossils of different life forms. Okay. So if you are seeing a fossil around some 100 years ago, some life forms are there. That one you are getting from some topper part of this earth. If you are going to the deeper part, you will get earlier life forms. Okay. 
So the fossils, different age rock sediment that will contain the fossil of different life forms. So that uh, how that life forms you are getting that uh, probably they died during the formation of that particular sediment. Okay, when that particular sediment is formed, that time those life forms might have died. So some of them they will appear similar to the modern organism. Here you can see these fossils. They are similar to the modern organism. Some forms are similar to the modern organism. And, and these fossil forms, some, some of these fossil forms, they represent the extinct, extinct organism. Here you can see this is dinosaur. Dinosaur, at present dinosaurs are not there. Okay. So those, some fossils, they represent the extinct organism. But at the same time, some represents the Modern pattern, organism which are in the modern pattern or modern forms, they represent some kind of similarity with such kind of modern organisms. So both types are there. Some are not there on earth. But some organisms, forces, they represent similarity or they show similarity towards the uh, modern organism. So both types are there. And this Study of these fossils, this fossil study of this all, all the sedimentary layers, you can see that in each sedimentary, uh, sedimentary layer, that soil layer, that represents the time, particular period. So you can see different sedimentary layer that indicates the period, that particular period in which that organism is existed. Okay, so based on that we can study the age or the period of that organism's existence. And it's that kind of study that shows that life forms varied over time. Okay. And certain geological life spans, that time only some organisms, you can see some organism in certain period. After that, they won't be there or you won't get any details about such organisms. So certain geological period only you can see some kind of organs or you will get the details only during that period only. So after that you won't get. That means that's the end of that life form. Okay. So new forms of life that have arisen at different times. And there is an evolution or some kind of changes. That's why that kind of changes led to the modern organism. So all these, all this kind of studies... So the study of fossils in different sedimentary layers that indicates the geological period in which they existed. Okay. So the study of fossils in different sedimentary layers that is indicating the geological period in which those kind of organisms existed. And that study shows that life form that varied over time and certain life forms are restricted to certain geological time spans. So all these kind of studies, they are called as paleontological evidences. Such kind of evidences or studies, paleontology, that is the study of fossils. So such things are, all these kind of evidences are called as paleontological evidences. Got it? Then... Next, we are going to learn about embryological support for evolution. Okay, embryological support for evolution. Here you can see the embryo of different organisms. Here you can see the fish, salamander, tortoise, chick, rabbit, man, all these embryo embryos. You can see embryonic development of vertebrates. Okay, so embryological uh, support for evolution. What does it mean? That actually, that is proposed by Ernest Haeckel. Scientist Ernest Haeckel, he proposed the embryological studies, embryological support for or embryological observations for this evolution. So Ernest Haeckel, note down the name of the scientist Ernest Haeckel, he proposed the observations for this evidences. Okay, so based upon Haeckel's observations. 
certain features during embryonic stage common to all vertebrates that are absent in adult. What is that? In embryonic stage, certain features are common for all. But those features are absent in adult forms. Okay. So what Ernest Heckel proposed? From his observation, he proposed that some features during embryonic development, that embryonic stages show some kind of features. But that features are common to all. But the main point is that those features are absent in adults. Okay. So certain features during embryonic stage, it is common to all vertebrate, vertebrates and that features are absent in adults. So for example, what he is saying, the embryos of all vertebrate, vertebrates, including human being. Okay. So the embryos of all vertebrates, including human being, that develops a row of vestigial gill slit. Okay. Here you can see gills. Okay. Vestigial gill slit just behind the head. Okay, so just behind the head, a vestigial gill slit, it is present in the embryonic stage. This is the embryonic stages of fish. This is salamander, then tortoise, chick, rabbit, man. In all these stages, you can see gill slit, all vertebrates, that kind of stage is there. So according to Heckel's observation, in vertebrates, there is a vestigial gill slit in embryonic stage but it's not functional in adult stage that's what he proposed so what is that so including human they develop a row of vestigial gill slit just behind the head but it is functional only in fish later in later stages it is functional only in fish but it's not found in any other adult vertebrae. In fish, in adult stage also, that will be functional. This gill slits will be functional. Only in fish. What about the other, in tortoise, chick, rabbit, man and all, in adult stage, that gill slit won't be present. It will disappear. Okay? But the other, in the case of other vertebrates, it's not applicable in adult stage. Okay? So this proposal, this proposal got disproved. Okay? Who disproved? Carl Ernest. Carl Ernest, he disproved this. And he proved that, he noted that these embryos never pass through the adult stage of other animals. Okay? One embryo of one organism that will never pass through the adult stage of other animals. That's how he disproved the concept of Hecker, Ernest Hecker. Okay, Carl Ernest disproved that. How he disproved? In his, through his observations, he noted that embryos never pass through the adult stage of other animals. Okay, so embryological support for evolution. See, there are evidences for evolution. If you are getting a question like evidences of evolution, you have to give fossil, then embryological support for evolution. In embryological support for evolution, you can write, this is proposed by Ernest Haker and his observations you should write. There is a common stage to all vertebrates and the stage will be absent in adults. So, you can give an example how the gill slit which is present in all vertebrates in the embryonic state. But in the case of fish, it will be functional in adult stage also. But in all other organic vertebrates, it, that won't be functional. Gill slit won't be functional during adult stage. That is the example given by Ernest Haeckel. But who disproved that? Another scientist called Ernest. Called Ernest disproved that and he noted that embryos never pass through the adult stage of other animals. Okay, that's how the concept, Ernest Hecker's concept got disproved. Next.
Then, comparative anatomy and morphology. So many scientists, they did a comparison between today's organism and those organisms who existed, those existed years ago. Okay. The organism, those existed years ago and those who are found, those organisms which are found on earth today. There is a comparison. They made a comparison between both type of organisms. Okay. So, comparative anatomy and morphology. What does it mean? Comparative anatomy and morphology. Comparative study of organism. Those existed years ago. And between the organism which are present today. So there is a comparative study between old organisms and existing organisms. Okay. So this comparison. Why they are comparing these organisms? These comparisons and that able to find out through that comparison they were able to find out some similarities similarities and differences also definitely if there is a similarity there will be some kind of differences also right so such similarities that help them to interpret or there, there will be some interpretations out of these comparisons so that can be interpreted to understand whether a common ancestor is there or not. If they have a common ancestor, it, the ancestor is there or not. So, such similarities, simil from similarities what we can understand, they can interpret that there is a common ancestor. Okay. So, for example, whales, bats, cheetah and human. Means all mammals. All mammals share similarities in the pattern of bonds of four limbs. See here, bonds of four limbs. You can see here in man, in cheetah, in whale and bat. There is some kind of similarity. You can see some kind of similarity. For external appearance, all these organisms are different, right? But all are mammals, but they have some kind of similarity in the pattern of bonds. You can see the pattern of bonds of four limbs. So there is some kind of similarity existing. Okay. But one thing we need to know now. Here one thing we can see. What is that? These four limbs. Pattern of this four limb. It is similar. But they perform different functions in these animals. Okay. They have similar anatomical structure but they perform different functions. So all of them they have same pattern like there is some similarity in this structure. Right. But they perform different functions. So, what we can understand from this? All these animals, the same structure developed along different directions. Okay. Due to the adaptations. See, they are, see, whales. Whales, where it will be? In water. Right. And cheetah, that need to run. And man, for walking. Then bat, for flying. All these things. They are performing different functions. All these Organs are performing different functions in different organisms, right? So, these animals, the same structure develop along different directions. So, due to the, due to different needs, they, they develop different adaptations. Got it? So, their function is different. They are not using, all these organs are not used for the same purpose, right? They are using for movement, correct, but in different places they are using, right? So that needs some kind of adaptation. So due to that adaptation, all these differences, all these changes came. So that is called as divergent evolution. Okay? And this structure, they are called as homologous. Okay, 
homologous that homology that uh, homologous structures all these structures are homologous structures that means they have a common ancestor okay Then some more examples we can say that is in vertebrate the heart and brain that also shows this homologous organs and then divergent evolution. Got it? Due to the adaptation, they need different. They have different needs and due to that they got adapted and some changes. Came to that particular organs. Got it? That's why some kind of changes are appeared in this. Okay. So this is divergent evolution, and these structures are homologous. Okay. Then in plants also we can see such kind of evolutions. Okay. So that in bougainvillea and cucurbita, in cucurbita and bougainvillea, the thorn. Thorns in bougainvillea and tendrils of cucurbita that represents homology. Okay, so the homology homology is based on divergent evolution, but analogy analogy refers to exactly opposite concept. Analogy means, for example, we can say here. wings wings of butterfly and birds wings of butterfly and birds they are almost they look similar right but they are not similar structures see their function is same flying for both they uh, are both these organs are used for flight right even wings of butterfly and birds both they are using for flying purpose they are using for same purpose but they are not anatomically they are not at all similar they perform similar function that's all so analogous structures means that is the result of convergent evolution that is called as convergent evolution homologous means that is divergent evolution analogous means convergent evolution analogous means they are doing they are doing same function but anatomically they are not similar but performing same function those structures are called as analogous structures performing same function but anatomically different okay so that analogous structure they have developed or that is a result of convergent evolution then another example Another example is another example for this analogy that is eye of the octopus and mammal. Here you can see octopus eye and mammal's eye. Okay. So example for analogy, you can write down all these examples. Here earlier one example, the wings of birds and butterfly both are performing similar function but anatomically they are different here the same another one more example for analogy is eye of octopus and mammal here you can see octopus eye and mammal's eye both are used for same purpose right but anatomically they are entirely different okay then flippers of penguin and dolphin here you can see flippers of penguin and dolphin see the structure for penguin and dolphin flippers both are used for same purpose right for movement then it's used for same fu function but structure anatomical structure is entirely different so uh, we can say that similar habitat the similar habitat they they are staying in similar almost the habitat is same that's the that because of that reason 
they got the same adaptations like that we can explain this okay so in different group of organism but they got almost a similar function in that similar function it is due to the habitat so due to that similar kind of habitat that made the same kind of adaptations or such kind of similar features in the organisms so we can explain in that way also then another one is sweet potato sweet potato you can see the skin color one that is sweet potato and potato potato you know that is potato is the stem modification okay that is underground stem modification this is analogous similarity i'm saying so potato is the underground stem modification but another one sweet potato sweet potato is the root modification got it that is another example for analogy from animals and plants you have to learn the examples what i have explained in these examples are very important you will get to understand uh, this analogous and homologous organs for that from plants and animals you have to learn this example okay flippers of penguin and dolphin is it an example for homology or analogy like that you will get question sweet potato and potato these are one is root modification one is stem modification this is another example for analogy okay don't get confused between homologous and analogous then one more thing you have to learn from this is convergent and divergent evolution okay convergent evolution and divergent evolution then homologous organs and analogous organs then next point is protein some proteins and genes they are performing a particular function among different organisms this also gives a clue to the common ancestry okay this also shows a point towards the common ancestry in diverse organisms same protein and same genes they are performing a particular function so that shows a common ancestry behind all this organism so these biochemical similarities they they are pointing out the same ancestry and structural similarities among different organisms so these points we need to not what common proteins and genes some genes common genes are present in all the organisms some organisms not all almost some organisms a group of organisms then some proteins they are doing some particular function some particular function is done by some proteins so all these the similar this shows the similarities right in different type of organisms some particular genes are performing same function in all the organism they are performing the same function then in 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 the case of some proteins that proteins are performing similar function in mentioned organisms so this shows there is a common ancestry this is also a reason to believe that there is a common ancestry behind this organisms okay so this kind of biochemical similarities it is pointing out the same ancestry and structural similarity among diverse organisms okay then so we have selected some animals then plants and some agricultural models and all right for agriculture purpose and horticulture purpose we have bred so many animals and plants what do you mean by that breeding 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 means it's for some special characters you are joining them some special characters of two organisms or two plants okay see if one plant is very tall but that is giving very less fruits okay and another plant which is very short but it is giving a number of fruits per plant it is more so we want to join both characters so that 
science that is called as breeding plant breeding in the case of plants is the same work is done in the case of animals also some particular characters so the characters are joined and they are they are forming a new organism okay that quality we are adding that quantitative and qualitative characters in each generation that is called as breeding so man has bred selected plants and animals for agriculture purpose horticulture purpose and all those things so man has domesticated many wild animals and crops okay so this breeding program that that has created breeds that differ from other breeds okay so here breeding program breeding program is that that organism the newly formed organism also belongs to the same group but it is having some kind of differences from other organism isn't it so within hundreds of years man could create new breeds that is the point so within a few years a man or like human beings can create new breeds or new kind of organism with some kind of changes then think about nature so over million of years so many changes so many changes might have done the nature itself or nature might have done so many changes right but that slowly that is making changes nature is making changes that took million of years that might have taken million of years so if a man can create changes within hundreds of years like so many changes some beneficial changes and some kind of profitable changes man can create means definitely million of years this million of in this million of years nature might have done so many changes right in the organism that is called the evolution so that itself proves the evolution got it then there is another interesting observation uh, which is supporting the evolution that is natural selection evolution by natural selection that from england so uh, in a collection in a collection of moths made in 1850s okay those uh, moth collection that they collected some scientists collected moths in 1850 they made a study about this and before industrialization that is the point before industrialization it was more white winged moths okay before industrialization that is the point to be noted here before industrialization white winged moths were so many okay moths were present on trees okay that dark winged dark winged and or melanized moths that dark winged moths are called as melanized moths those moths were less before industrialization okay so more white winged moths were present on trees compared to dark winged or melanized moths so in that collection collection from same area after industrialization and okay, when they collected before industrialization uh, white winged moths were more compared to dark winged or melanized moths so after this is this shows before industrialization this after industrialization that means during 1920 so that time more dark winged moths in the same area they did the collection that was Or, or in that collection, they got more dark winged moths, more number of dark winged moths from the same area. So the proportion, that proportion was exactly reversed. When they collected before industrialization, there were white winged moths compared to dark winged. 
But after industrialization, during 1920s, they did from the same place they did the collection, but the melanized or uh, dark winged moths were more in that collection. And how they explain this concept is. See, in a contrasting background, when it is white, or in a contrasting background, the predators, the insect eating organisms, or the predators will find out the moths. Okay, in the contrasting background. So, after industrialization, the trees became dark. So, how they are explaining this concept? What is the reason for that change? Or how that white winged most proportion came down or how it became very less and how this uh, black wing or that melanin moth became more. What is the reason for that? How they are explaining that? They explain that the predators will find out the moth from the contrasting background. How, how the uh, background became contrasting? After industrialization, the tree trunks became very dark due to the industrial smog. Or due to that pollution, the tree trunks became so dark. So the white winged moths became visible from the tree trunks. Okay. So the predators or the insect eating organisms, they started killing this. Or it was difficult to survive for white winged moths. So under that condition, the white winged moth did not survive due to the predators. So at the same time, dark winged or melanized moth, they were able to survive because predators were not able to find out the dark winged moth. Because already the tree trunks are in black color, from that it was difficult to find out the dark winged moths. So the white winged moths did not survive due to predators. At the same time, dark winged or melanized moths survived. So before industrialization set in, that white color Moths, they were able to survive, but after industrialization, when the tree trunk became dark, they were not able to survive due to the predators. At the same time, dark winged moths were survived. Okay, so that is the reason, or that's how they gave the explanation for that survey. So before industrialization, that lichens, lichens, you know, that is the indicator of pollution. Okay, where pollution is very less, lichens will be more. So in that case, this industrial pollution indicators, these lichens can be used as industrial pollution indicators. So they will grow in a region where there is less pollution. Okay, they won't grow in the polluted area. So this In the same way, in the polluted area, they, this uh, lichens cannot survive. In the same way, this white wind, they gave the explanation for white wind and dark wind moths. In the same way, we can explain the case of lichens also. Okay, lichens will not survive in the polluted area. And next. What are the evidences for evolution in this one? In evolution, here from this uh, white winged and uh, dark winged moth, what, what evidence you got? See, this is a kind of evolution. Evolution means slow changes. So after few years, you, you were able to find out the change. Okay, so that white winged moth, that ratio got reduced in that area. Okay. So in the same way, some organisms, they wiped out from the earth. Okay. So this kind of change, these changes made the, or that affected the existence of some kind of organism. That's what we can understand from this example. Okay. It's not like some uh, pollution that reduced the number of this organism. That shows this. That's how we can explain the evidence of evolution. Okay. So the moths, moths were able to 
hide in the background. Okay, they were able to hide in that background. That's how they got survived. So, from this, what we can understand in a mixed population, the last point is in a mixed population, a population here, dark wind is there, uh, white wind is there. So, in a mixed population, those which are having better adaptation that can survive. So, this explains the survival of the fittest. Okay. Nothing is wiped out completely. Here, nothing is wiped. Both are there, but the ratio that got reduced. Okay. The population size of each one. So, which is having better adaptation, that population size increased and the other one got reduced. Got it? Then, excess use of herbicides. Herbicide, pesticide, everything. That nowadays we are using this more. So, excess use of herbicides and pesticides. That resulted in the selection of resistant varieties in a much lesser time scale. So, in a lesser time scale, the selection of resistant varieties. So, use of herbicides and pesticides that resulted in the selection of a resistant variety in a lesser time period. So, resistant organisms. So, resistant organisms are appearing in a time scale of months or years. And that is not at all taking centuries. In the next generation, that is getting some more resistance. And when that uh, generation is moving, that resistance power is also increasing. So the resistant organism or resistant cell, they are appearing in a short duration. And it is not taking many years. It's not taking centuries to achieve that character, resistant character. So the, all these are examples for Evolution, evolution by anthropogenic action. So, this is also giving that evolution is not a direct process. And it's taking time. Then, next is adaptive radiation. Next concept is adaptive radiation. In Galapagos Island, in that island Darwin, Darwin conducted some studies. So he observed small black birds. Small black birds. They called as Darwin's finches. So he realized that all these varieties, here you can see different types of bees they have. All these varieties evolved in the same island only. So from that, the original seed-eating features. Some have seed-eating features and many other forms. They have different type of beaks. Here you can see the beak. Okay. This is smaller one. This is a little more thicker. This is very thick or wide one. And in this, some are seed-eating. And some, they are insectivorous. And vegetarian finches also. Here, different types of finches you can see. So, this is the process of evolution. So, in a different, like different species are forming. In a given geographical area, means in the same geographical area, you can see different adaptations, different species, evolution of different species due to different adaptations. So, from a point, these are radiating to other areas of geographical or different habitats. This is called as adaptive radiation due to different adaptations or different eating habits. Okay, but they all these are developed in the same geographical area. So, different species in a given geographical area starting from a point and literally radiating to other areas of geographical, uh, areas of geography or habitat. It is called as adaptive radiation. The process of evolution of different species in a given geographical area. So, there are 
different species evolving in the given geographical area that starting from a point and it is literally radiating to other areas of geographical uh, areas of that habitat or in a particular habitat it is radiating to other areas so that is called as adaptive radiation so darwin finches this birds they are called later they called as black birds they are called as darwin finches they call this phenomenon this is the best example for adaptive radiation got it then another example is australian marsupials so in this also you can see adaptive radiation the more when more than one adaptive radiation is appeared to have occurred in an isolated geographic area one can call this convergent evolution so how when we can call it as a convergent evolution more than one adaptive radiation if there is only one adaptive radiation in a geographical area we cannot call it as convergent evolution more than more than one adaptive radiation is appearing in a particular geographical area we can call it as convergent evolution to so the placental mammals placental mammals in australia they are also exhibiting the adaptive radiation in evolving into varieties of such placental mammals okay placenta of wolf and tasmanian wolf marsupial marsupials these these two all these examples they are the example for adaptive radiation so in adaptive radiation here the black birds in galapagos or darwin finches they are called as darwin finches different beak size in that and here the placental animals placental animals of australia these are the example for adaptive radiation okay so do you have any doubt in this so hope the concept of this re adaptive radiation is clear